Good morning, everybody. Uh, well, thanks for joining, and welcome to the second round, Unit 2, of New EPIC's uh, Wastewater Training uh, with Jim LaLiberty. I'm Drew Youngs, and I'll be moderating uh, Jim's training today. So as uh, same as last time, for those of you maybe that weren't here, just wanted to go over um, a couple housekeeping items. Excuse me, I'm, I made a mistake. Make sure you guys are on the same page as me. Okay. So just wanted to uh, go over a couple of housekeeping items. So uh, those of you that are calling in, you're on mute, uh, and that's just to reduce the background noise. If you want to communicate with me, the moderator, feel free to use the chat function. Uh, it's at the top right of your screen. Um, or if you, if you go to full screen and hover your mouse at the top, um, a drop-down menu should come up, and you can use the chat function. Feel free to ask questions uh, to Jim about the training uh, at any time, and, and what I'll do is I'll just kind of keep a log of those questions and, uh, you know, ask Jim when he takes a break. So you don't have to wait until we prompt you for questions. If, if something's on the tip of your tongue, feel free to uh, put a question out there, and, and we'll address it when the time comes. Um, again, just use, the, uh, use your mouse and hover at the top of your screen uh, to toggle in and out of full screen, and that's how you can use those functions. Um, and uh, again, the webinar, just like last time, we're going to record this. Um, so you can access it at a later date if you have uh, other colleagues that want to see it. Um, maybe if they missed this week and they want to catch up before next week, um, we'll, we'll work to put both Unit 1, which was last week, as well as Unit 2 uh, online for you to, to review before our, our third unit, which is in a couple weeks. Still getting through the speed bumps, so the technical gets difficulties. So sorry about that, everyone. So uh, I'll keep the intro brief today. Um, this was in the last presentation as well. Jim's been at New Epic for a long time, and he is an expert on wastewater. So we'll uh, we'll let him do the, the training. We'll leave it at that for now. <laughs> so again, the, the training is broken into three units. We've already covered one. Um, today's unit, unit two, we will go over a little bit on microbiology, biological treatment fixed film systems, and suspended growth systems. And I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to Jim. Thank you, Drew. Okay. So last week uh, we talked about uh, primarily physical chemical type uh, treatment uh, that we do in the plant, and we jumped over the biological process. Uh, as a physical treatment in terms of removing uh, what we call screenings, uh, debris of various sorts, uh, chunks of wood, cans, rags, what have you. Large uh, material that the biological process can't treat. We also talked about removal of grit. Dense inorganic material like sand and coffee grounds and eggshells uh, that, again, bugs aren't going to eat. So we want to take that out because it's damaging to equipment in the process. We also jumped forward to the end of the process when we talked about disinfection, where we took care of the pathological bacteria that we fear are in the wastewater and need to deal with in order to maintain good, healthy uh, environment. So this week we're going to talk about what our process is really about. Uh, the main uh, gist of wastewater treatment is a biological process. Uh, we have a lot of organic matter that comes into the plant, and we need a biological process to break that down, largely done. Uh, the majority of the organisms that do this work are just single-celled bacteria, microscopic little guys that do a great amount of work in a fairly short amount of time. And let's see if we've got, uh, this is where we are in the process, kind of in the middle of the, the plant, from the water standpoint. Is where we're at. And this is where we're going to do our work. And we've got a number of different ways to treat this. And what we have now is after our primary treatment, uh, we saw last week we went through screening or grinding, we went through grit removal, and then we went through primary clarifiers, where we removed settleable solids and floatable solids, took those out of the water. And basically what we have now is all of our uh, solids of that type are gone. We've removed some of our suspended solids, 
but we do have the bulk of our, uh, all of our dissolved solids. The bulk of the BOD is in solution, so you can't screen it out, you can't filter it out, it's going to be in the process, and this is what we're attacking. Uh, from a visual standpoint, it looks like relatively clean water. And for, well, up, up through the 1960s, uh, a lot of facilities kind of stopped at this point. They disinfect and then off it would go. It would just be strictly primary treatment, which meant that the amount of dissolved solids we had in the wastewater went right into the river. So this is what our job is in terms of biological treatment. We need to remove what we call CBOD, that's carbon-based biochemical oxygen organic matter. We have to take care of non-settleable solids. We went through our primary clarifiers, settleable solids came out quite readily, but the non-settleable solids are colloidal material, very small uh, particles that have no real mass to them. They don't want to go up. They don't want to go down. They just stay in the water and make it look turbid. We have to find some way of taking those out of the process. We're actually going to use the organisms to do that for us. And in all probability, your plant now has to take care of the nutrients, the nitrogen and phosphorus loading coming into the plant, and reduce that down to pretty close to zero. So this is all you got to do. It's a very simple process. You feed the bugs, you remove the bugs, and everybody's happy. When I talk about bugs, I'm talking about the bacteria, the single-celled organisms. Everyone's going to do this work for us. Again, this is what they are. The 95% of the organisms treated in this wastewater are just single-celled bacteria. And they're made up of carbohydrates and proteins and some organics and some other stuff. And they reproduce by fission. Literally just break into two. Uh, so here's our process broken down to the simplest terms. We've got food. That's the organic matter in the wastewater. We've got the bacteria. Bacteria come from a variety of sources. Uh, humans themselves provide a vast amount of them. Uh, they come in from the soil. Uh, much as we try, our sewer systems are not all that tight. So water and organisms leak in through broken pipes and cracked joints. So we get a supply of them from there, too. And we have to give them oxygen. Given that, they've got food, they've got oxygen, they're happy kids, so they'll go through synthesis. They make more bugs. But then we break it down, what we're doing is we're taking the organic matter that comes into the plant and we're turning it into bacteria. <laughs> During that synthesis process, they respirate, and they're taking in oxygen the same way we do, and they give off carbon dioxide, CO2. And they also generate a little bit of heat in the process. So if you were to go through your plant during the wintertime, you look at your biological reactors, you're going to see a fair amount of vapor above those tanks because it's heating up from the activity that's going on. Yeah, when they're respirating, they get off CO2, some ammonia, some other stuff. As I mentioned, they reproduce by fission. They consume organic matter, and at some point they just, boom, break into two. They continue to do that. And if you look at their reproduction cycles, depending on the organism we're looking at, it's very short, a matter of minutes, up to hours, or even days for some other ones. But if you were to look at organisms with a 30 minute life cycle and you kept them fed and aerated in 12 hours, that's what you end up with, starting with one, just by them doubling every 30 minutes. That's why we have to remove the bugs. So we talk about uh, microbiology to some degree. Yeah. Water, pretty much water anywhere, contains organisms. Uh, two years ago, I was trying to set up our microscope, and we don't have a treatment plant, but it had rained that morning, so I just went out in the backyard, got some water out of a puddle, put it under the scope, and there's all sorts of little critters running around, and they're all over the place. Uh, the time that we find a wastewater, we've got rod shaped, we've got spiral, we've got spherical. Different organisms. And this is basically what they're made of. 80% of them is just water. The other 20% dry matter. And of that dry matter, 90% is organic. 
theoretically, if you got your junior chemistry kid out and you uh, went to work, C58702N, you got a bug. I've never tried it. But really, if you break them down, they've got a, a lot of different things, largely carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus is an important thing for them, and they pick up some trace compounds treatment in that respect. And that's what a single cell bacteria, a little flagellate. And you've got all of these uh, ribosomes and stuff that keeps them going. The neat thing about them is they have this, this capsule is their outer wall and on top of that they've got this uh, sticky substance, basically a polysaccharide, a sugary substance, very sticky. And we're going to use that to help polish the water when we settle them out later on. That's how we get rid of that suspended matter that's making the water look turbid. So without getting too deeply into microbiology, we look at two different types of uh, organisms, two classes, heterotrophic and autotrophic, the ones that we deal with. They differ in their nutrition requirements. The heterotrophs use organic carbon as their energy source. They're going to remove the CBOD from our process. I think whatever comes in, bring that down. And these got carbon to carry on. They can be aerobic, they can be anaerobic, but the vast majority of them are what we call facilitative bacteria. They prefer to have free dissolved oxygen in the water, but if you don't have it, they can look around for other sources of oxygen. The autotrophs inorganic carbon, carbon dioxide for their energy. And they also oxidize inorganic compounds, and they're the ones that do nitrates and sulfates. They'll do nitrification for us. So if we, next uh, two weeks from now, we talk about nitrification, we'll actually be talking about autotrophic bacteria that are employed in that particular process. So we want to keep them healthy. We want them to perform the best they can in order to do that, they have to have certain nutrients. For every 100 pounds of carbon that we have to break down, we should have 5 pounds of nitrogen and 1 pound of phosphorus in the wastewater. If we don't have that proper ratio, they're not going to function as well as they should. But it's somewhat ironic in that we're very concerned about removing nitrogen and phosphorus from our wastewater, but we also have to make sure that we've got a certain amount in there to uh, keeps the process working properly. And we also need dissolved oxygen, at least a half a milligram per liter of gutter. Generally runs considerably higher. That's a minimum for it. So, microscope exam. Uh, you guys get a chance to look at the microscope last week? No. You had a microscope? Yeah. I don't remember it. The so commission, me commission meeting, poster session? Oh, no. I thought you meant in the class. Uh, it's an important part of process control. Uh, you know, we've got very large systems that don't change very quickly, generally. Unless somebody nukes your plant and then you've got to find out what the heck happened. But things change slowly, so looking under the microscope to see who's around is a very important part of keeping track of what's happening in your plant. And this chart that we've got over here is uh, indicative of all the organisms you might come across in the process. And by seeing who's there, it tells you a lot about how your process is run. So we've got phase contrast mics, so these have been dyed. It helps identify certain uh, organisms. Sometimes that helps in differentiating, particularly filamentous bacteria. We've got a new It's a blob, basically. It just flows around. It's, uh, very inefficient feeder. Uh, it basically has to bump into its food source. It's got that pseudopod and kind of wraps around it and slowly digests the food. This is something you find very early in starting up a treatment. This means young sludge. It doesn't take very long to develop these. They're not very sophisticated. We get into flagellates. And this one, you can see his little tail. That helps him swim around. He's actually going to go looking for food. Little clump that you see up here on the top is kind of yellowish. 
above the, the euglena. That is a clump of untold number of single cell bacteria all lumped together as flock particles. You can see the difference in size between this fellow and any one of these. I don't know how many you're in there. When you talk about free swimming ciliates, uh, these are ciliates. They have little hairs all around their body to help them swim. When you look at them under the microscope, they're little race cars just shooting across the field. They're very quick in moving around and searching out their food source. Uh, quite often you'll see them feeding around the outer edges of a flock particle, as you do in this uh, upper left picture here. The stock ciliates, the ones that look like uh, tulips, that is what we really want to see when we look under a microscope. That is indicative of a very well-run process. Things are very good. I find single ones, but you also find them in colonies like this. More free swimming ciliates up here. That's what everybody's looking for. This particular one, this is Sutturia. This is a, a stock ciliate of a different variety. And instead of having that open mouth, stock ciliates have that open mouth with the cilia there, and they help throw the food down inside uh, that tulip shape so they can digest it. Well, this one has all these little spikes out there. And as a little organism goes by, it just sucks them in on the end of that spike and then pulls their guts out, basically. And that's their food source. Kind of a horrible type of a thing. <laughs> as we're getting into these larger uh, organisms, a rotifer uh, gets its name from the fact that it goes through it. It's kind of spiral, somewhat like a football, as it moves through the water. Indicating when we see this type of organism in numbers under the microscope is we're starting to get older sludge now. And you see its size in relationship to this clump of probably millions of single cell bacteria all clumped up. Nematodes, worms, very old sludge. That means we've got to start doing something. We have to remove them. It shouldn't be dead. Old sludge could be difficult. And then there's a uh, water bear. We actually had one of these under the stove the other day. Just about to make out his feet. It's kind of interesting. Oh. And he cute? That's what he really looks like. Oh, gross. <laughs> they become very popular all of a sudden. I don't know why. There's t-shirts and stuff. That these guys really? He's a creepy little guy. Very old sludge. And we got some stuff like bristle worms. Oh. Uh, you know, these high nitrates in your wastewater. You get a lot of these into your system, you walk out to a clarifier, it looks like somebody killed an ox. <laughs> uh, what we're seeing in this particular photograph is uh, it almost looks like there's a crazy spider in the middle of it all, but these wiry type things, it's a different type of organism. We refer to it as filamentous organisms, and there's a wide variety of these. This is something we want to see in some number because, as you can see in here, it helps hold flock particles together. And when we finish our process, what we want is we want large flock particles so we can settle it out in the clarifier. This helps it's kind of like a rebar to hold it all together. Uh, just different ones. If you get too many, then you have trouble settling out in your clarifier. Uh, this is where it's a certain art form in being able to identify which ones are out. Really troublesome. You get this type of a deal. It's like a plate of spaghetti. You're never going to clean up your water properly. You've got to find the reason for this particular filament and correct it and get rid of it. You know, a lot of, they're out there for a lot of different reasons. Low dissolved oxygen, high organic loading. You get a particular one. Uh, no cardiac. You get a lot of grease. Uh, you get this particular one. It's kind of nasty. It has a very distinctive structure. So it's somewhat easy to recognize under the scope. Fungus. Fungi. Generally an indication of low pH conditions. But by looking under there, we can learn a lot about how our process is running. Remember the fact that our plant is running on data that's five days old. Well, it helps to look under this. I'll find out before you get that bad number out of there. 
algae, a common problem on the wheels of clarifiers. So these organisms they have uh, what we refer to as three phases of growth. And you, you look at it from the standpoint of we're starting up a whole new process. Kind of the we work in Another way of looking at it. Uh, there's log growth, declining growth, and what we call endogenous phase. Blood growth is, again, we're starting a process. So I've got very few buds, but I've got a lot of food. So there's no competition for the food. It's easy to find. There's plenty of it. So they just eat and reproduce like crazy. And your population, the dotted line, goes up dramatically. Your food, the solid line, comes down quickly because they're just gobbling this stuff up like crazy. In the declining growth stage, now you've got to stop looking for the food. You've got to compete for it. So the growth rate slows down. And our food process is still dwindling here, coming down. We finally get into the last phase, which is called endogenous phase, where there's very little food, but we've got a lot of bugs. So they basically self-cannibalize. Turn on themselves and go after their own carbon as an energy source. Happening. Exponential growth. Oh. Got a particular process that we really show that. The declining growth a little further down into the system as we've developed a lot of uh, population and we don't have so much food anymore, and ultimately into the endogenous phase. There are plants that actually operate on this principle. U.S. Filthy used to sell one that they called the animal for obvious reasons. Well, this is what's happening in that night in the space. Lack of food. There's no food. We've got bacteria, we've got oxygen. So the bacteria become the food for the other ones. A lot of you guys go after the small one, they break it down into. And again, this is you know, a good place to run because you actually be, end up with less sludge in the long run than you do with a conventional process. Because they're just chewing themselves up. Yellow circle. That's about where you want your plant to be, right about at that point there. Just enough food to it. As I mentioned, we've got a lot of different ways of doing this process. Uh, we break it down into two basic categories attached growth or fixed film, represented by trickling filters and rotating biological contactors. And then we have suspended growth activated sludge and all its iterations. So this is a trickling filter. This is developed in the latter part of the 19th century in England. Came across the United States pretty soon afterwards. This is a uh, modern day version of one. Uh, we've got a large tank, uh, generally circular but not always. And inside that we'll have a media. And we're going to let the water trickle down through the media, but the bugs do their thing. So there's a cross section. So we have a tank. Here we've got a, a circular one. Uh, in this part of the country, there's, there's not too many of them uh, here in New England anymore. Pittsfield has them. Uh, I'm trying to think of who else has them. Uh, they're generally built into the ground for temperature reasons. They don't do too well in the winter if they're exposed. Uh, but in the bottom of the tank, we have what's called under drain. It's a support system. Support the media without the water to pass on through. We have a picture of that in a second. And then we have the media. The media varies from rock, about the size of your fist or a baseball, uh, up to uh, plastic structures of various sorts. And we have a distribution system. Uh, this one shows two arms that rotate with nozzles along the length of the arm that spray the water out across the top area of the tank. Uh, could have four. They're generally driven by the water flow coming up through the shaft. So, early days of uh, under drains, they were made out of vitreous clay. Now they're made out of fiberglass and plastic materials. Very sturdy. And it's just there to support the structure and allow water to pass on through. Got a picture here. This is using the uh, plastic film. Now, the build, 
Originally it was random fill, it would be rocks, it would be broken bricks, slag, material like that. You can see in this particular picture. And its purpose is to provide surface area for the organisms to live on. The more surface area, the more bugs, the more bugs, the more water you can treat. But if you think of it, think of a tank full of rocks. Now you've got a certain volume in that tank and you've got all these rocks that are wedged up against each other. The volume of the rock is solid, so there's no help in there. You're losing some uh, effectiveness. You also have all these pinch points for stuff to collect and, and clog. So a lot of plants in an upgrade would switch their random fill to something like this. These are uh, plastic devices, again, just to provide surface area. But if you look at them, the actual plastic structure is, takes up very little volume, very thin material, but it gives you a lot of space, a lot of airflow. There's also what we call structured fills. Not like hay bales, not like honeycomb, you just lay them in there. Uh, it's long sheets of plastic, but a lot of room inside there. There's a lot of space. And if you look at the difference between them, uh, this is showing the amount of, again, area is what matters to us, the amount of area per volume, uh, and how much void space you have in media, crushed stone, the original version, you get roughly 20 square feet per cubic foot of tank and your void space is 50 to 60, which is hard to believe when you look at it. So I've got room for the air to pass through and the water to pass through, and I've got some space. Uh, slag, not much better. We come down to the random plastic on the bottom here. Depending on the type that you choose, you're doubling at a minimum up to four times the amount of area in a given volume. And the void space is fantastic. You don't have to worry so much about clogging, Got good airflow through, everybody sees air, you don't go anaerobic. The structured packing, that hay bale type of stuff, again, 30 to 60 square feet per cubic foot, and again, great void space in there. So if I need to upgrade my plant, you know, all these plants that were built back in the 60s or 70s, those towns are no longer the same size, so by and large, they've grown considerably. So if they need to upgrade the plant, well, they can just take out the rock put in this random plastic, and they're at least doubling their capacity to treat just by doing that. Relatively low capital investment. Because our rotary distributor, this particular unit has four arms, and we have an orifice stretched out across that, so we get a nice even distribution over the surface area at the top of the tank, and it all flows on down. These tanks can vary generally from four to eight feet deep. There are some uh, high rate ones that are about 40 feet tall. Not so much. There are rectangular ones. And obviously in a rectangular one, you don't have a sweep arm to spread the air out. So they've got basically a bunch of lawn sprinklers out there to help spread the water around. diagram here of kind of what's going on. Uh, we've got our water coming in, trickles over the surface area, works its way down through the media, passes over the media. media. Organisms live on that surface, which is why we want to have a lot of surface area. They're going to consume the organics. We have air is supplied here. There's a natural draft by the water flowing through the media. So we've got oxygen. They've got their food. They're happy little guys. And our water should come out pretty well clean. We're also going to get uh, what we call sloughing. Because what happens is, uh, let me jump ahead here, uh, it's our rock, and we grow this slime, the zoglial slime, on the media. And it gets thicker and thicker and thicker. However, at some point, the organisms who originally attached themselves to that surface no longer get the food, they no longer get the oxygen, they go anaerobic and they die. And the water flow as it comes by will then knock this stuff off the medium. Call this sloughing. If we were just, they didn't come off, then this thing would just get thicker and thicker and just clog the whole thing up. Now, I said we have to remove the bugs. This isn't removing. This is removing it from the trickling filter, but not from the process. Airflow. The water is colder, like in the summertime. Air flow is downwards in the wintertime. If you drive by a plant with trickling filters, you'll just see this vapor 
cloud hovering over the top of the tank as it tends to go upward with the warmer water. So we can break these down into three basic types of uh, trickling filters. The standard rate, that's my process. This is all I have. We have high rate. Much higher rate, higher flow rate, and we have what's called a roughing filter. So, again, when we look at these, it's we look at hydraulic loading and organic loading. We only want to put so much water to this unit over the course of a day, and it's based on the square footage of the tank itself. The organic loading is based on the volume of the tank, the cubic footage. So, we want to stay within certain ranges. Uh, they tend to have recirculation for some reason. Sloughing, as we see here, because it's such a low rate, it's kind of intermittent. So you may have to do things to control that. You don't want it to get too thick. And six to eight feet deep, but it'll remove 80 to 85 percent of your VOD. It's good enough to get you through your permit. So you know, if you've got a small town, it's a, not a very high tech operation. Works pretty well. Uh, this bottom line here, filter flies. That's one of the uh, issues with a trickling filter. A particular little bat and that type of a fly, the psychota fly, they're called filter flies, and they just hover around the tank. Yeah, because of the low flow, you're really not flushing out the eggs or anything, and they'll just repopulate, which is problematic. High rate filters, much higher flow rate from an uh, hydraulic standpoint. We're always recirculating here. The sloughing's continuous because of that high rate, so we're always knocking material off the media. A uh, little less on the VOD removal. And a roughing filter, a roughing filter is a particular unit where I've got a plant and I've had trickling filters for years, but I have to upgrade. And they're also putting other constraints on me like nitrogen removal or something else. So a trickling filter is not the best method of dealing with it. But I've got these units here. So I'm going to retain these. <coughs> I'm going to run through my process at a very high rate of flow. And I'm going to pick up about, if you look down here, BOD removal, about 50% of the BOD is going to come out. Now I can build an activated sludge plant, which is the one with the most control, after this, and it doesn't have to be as large because I've already taken a big cut of my BOD out. So that's what a roughing filter does. It removes a certain amount of that BOD so you can have your subsequent process can be that much smaller. Very common in a place like this. If you go out to uh, Pittsfield, that's what they'll have. Yeah, recirculation is there for uh, we have uh, a summer like this past summer where flows are extremely low. Uh, we don't want the filter to dry out. We want to keep things moving, so we're going to recirculate water just to keep everything in good shape. It's also there if, uh, particularly if it's a standard rate filter, I can crank up my recirculation rate to blow out some of those filter fly eggs. Take care of that issue. And it can also be used to dilute incoming wastewater. We tend to have a high VOD uh, uh, situation coming in for whatever reason. What's the strength of the wastewater coming in? We need to uh, basically blow the snot out of the darn tank. We have to do that. Keep things going during low flow situations. Keep it all wetted. Uh, bonding in a minute, <clears throat> dilute toxic waste, and bringing some material back in, more organisms back to the process. You know, we don't want to dry out. That summer was a really difficult time for everybody because it was so dry. When we talk about operational problems, uh, fall is a particularly tough time of year for trickling filters when all the leaves are dumping out and on where they're located. <clears throat> you got to make sure the top of these beds are clear. Excuse me. <clears throat> uh, the term ponding refers to just that. You take a look at the top of your filter and you've got standing water. What that means is your media below that is plugged for one reason or another. And if no water is flowing through there, then likely it's going to dry out, it's going to go anaerobic, it's going to smell, and you're going to get calls from the neighbors. So you have to deal with that. Crank up the research. Put more flow in there, try to flush it out. 
Worst case scenario, we'll just flood the entire filter. Let it soak, let it rake up the material that's clogging it, and then drain it up. Yeah, that's generally a cause of the odors if you've got that kind of blockage. The filter flies, it's a real problem, particularly in low rate filters. It gets to be a problem. You crank up the recirculation rate, blow all the eggs out, get rid of them, keep things going. Yeah. A relatively simple operation. Uh, in terms of process control, not a whole lot to do. Throw the water in there, see what the bugs do, and you get what you get. The other method of uh, attached growth is rotating biological contact. Uh, these are generally in smaller facilities. Uh, they're very common in what we refer to as package plants. Uh, if you've got uh, an industrial park or a Shopping mall, it's got us to treat their own material. Uh, these things are very common. The nursing home down in the Cape that runs a couple. They're indoors. In this part of the country, they're always indoors. What we've got is uh, California. They just shrouded it. We've got a tank and we've got a, a shaft 25 feet long. And on that shaft, we've got a series of plastic discs. Old slew of them on there. And that provides the surface And these discs slowly rotate through that vat of wastewater. About 35% of those discs are immersed in the wastewater. They turn very slowly, a couple RPM. So the bugs go down, they get their food. They come up, they get their air, they get down, they get their food, they come up, they get their air, they're happy. Again, they just build that slime on these discs, same as we saw in the uh, trickling filter. On this, though, we really don't have a mechanism for that stuff coming off. It just has to fall out naturally. We have no research to do anything. It's just a very simple process. A uh, 25-foot shaft, about 12 foot diameter, probably has 100,000 square foot of surface area on it. You get a lot of surface area. Works very well. <clears throat> but again, very low tech. You kind of get what you get. You don't control the population the way you do with an activated sledge process. You generally chain or direct drive. There are some that are actually air driven bubble air into the tank, and we have what's uh, down in Wallingford, Connecticut. You can see these extended portions on this unit here. Those are what's called air cups. The air gets caught inside those cups and helps rotate the drum. It also augments the dissolved oxygen in the tank itself to make sure we've got an adequate amount. This is the media. This one was not operating at the time. It's the same process as your disc, and we slowly grow that slime on there. Water passes by, the bugs do their thing. At some point, the anaerobic portion just dies off and the sloughings come out. And we're going to take those out in another clarifier. This one, this one is actually operating, it's hard to tell. Uh, if you were to see it in better lighting, you'd see there's some reddish areas inside this slime that's hanging on the disc. That indicates that they were nitrifying at the time. Yeah, typical uh, setup. We've got our preliminary treatment, our primary clarifier, and then we go through our RBCs. Typically they'll have banks of four run in series. And then the sloughings from these, this is true of uh, the trickling filter too, is going to go to a secondary clarifier, much like what we saw in the primaries. We have to remove those organisms at this point. They're covered even in other parts of the country. Here we need to keep them covered or indoors because of freezing, a real issue. Uh, heavy rains would wash it off if it were just out there in the rain. Uh, sunlight's not good for algae and it's also not good for the disc surface itself, it's down the plastics. So when these things are running normally, we're going to have a uniform shaggy brown to gray biomass. I mean, it's shaggy. It's just 
hanging off this stuff. There should be a few bare spots. But as you go through from one unit to the next, if you've got a four-stage unit, that third and fourth may be kind of sparse as the BOD is pretty much exhausted at that point. Uh, if it's black and smelly, then we've overloaded the unit. You can also see somewhere you've got a white biomass on there. That's indicative of a couple of filamentous organisms over here that thrive on sulfur compounds. If we're nitrifying, we're going to see a reddish-brown biomass. It'll do 80 to 95 percent BOD removal, do very well. You can get your nitrogen down fairly well. They, they downsize quite well. You generally don't see them in plants greater than three million gallons a day. Uh, been to the Charlton uh, rest area on the turnpike. Right up behind there is their treatment plant, and they're all running off RBCs. How are we doing? Do we have any questions? Or? Uh, yeah, so getting back to, uh, it's been a few slides, but the water bears, water uh, bears yes. <laughs> clearly a fan favorite. Oh, yeah. uh, are they dangerous organisms to have? They're not dangerous, no. I mean, if you're a single cell bacteria, it's probably not good to come in contact with it. No, but it, it's an indication that we have very old sludge. We tend not to get into that range. It's just something that we look for. Not particularly dangerous, no more dangerous than anybody else. And so maybe maybe the asker was referring, I'm assuming here, but what, like what if they were in drinking water, for instance? Is that something that drinking water is a concern? Uh, you've got problems with your drinking water company. Okay. So you wouldn't, that would I, I would not uh, recommend it, no. Okay. That, that should not be happening. But then they're not naturally pathogenic, they're not a parasite, it's just a particular organism that's out there. And for folks on the phone, if I'm not doing the best job capturing your question, feel free to shoot me a follow-up and we can keep that uh, conversation going. So another one, uh, Jim, you were kind of speaking on this recently. Um, so the, the question is, um, why do we need nitrogen and phosphorus in water? Aren't those harmful? Why do we need it in water? Yeah. Well, again, we need a certain amount for the organisms to be healthy. You've got to take your vitamins in the morning. They do, too. Uh, they will not perform their best if they don't have that required amount of nitrogen or phosphorus. It just is part of their metabolism. They need that in there. And that's, you know, when we talk about uh, particularly the phosphorus removal uh, in a couple of weeks, uh, how you do it can be detrimental to the process if you don't do it right. Because it's this chemical treatment, and you can do some in, up in your primary and say, okay, we'll take that phosphate clock out in the primary clarifier, but if you take out too much, then your biological process suffers because you don't have enough phosphorus for the bugs to be healthy. So it just, it's a requirement of their metabolism that we need that little bit of that. Any questions in the room? So I just had a question about the, um, you had talked about trickle filters. One of the maintenance aspects, if flows are not meeting the low end, is to just force flow and keep them wet. Wet. Um, I was wondering what the opposite end of the spectrum is. So if, if you're exceeding your max flow, like do you just, does it just accept the flow and then you maintain it after the fact, or do you divert part of the flow? Or? Well, this, this is an issue whether it's a trickling filter or any other uh, means of biological process. There are extremes in flow. Uh, you'd be amazed at how quickly your flow can triple and quadruple within a, an hour or two during a heavy rainstorm. Think of the area of drainage that you're covering with all your collection systems, all that water comes in. So it's probably more logical to think of it on the activated sludge uh, process. In an activated sludge, you've got bugs swimming around in tanks full of water. Okay? Now, when that flow goes from 3 million gallons a day rate up to 15 million gallons a day rate, what do you think the velocity of water is in those tanks? And how fast can a bug swim upstream? So if you can't do something, then you're going to wash out your bugs. Same thing with a trickling filter. You're going to flush everything out of that filter if you can't do something. There are situations when you can bypass your biological process in order to save the facility. You'll disinfect at the end, and when you 
you think of it, right, well, we went from 3 million to 15 million, but the difference wasn't all the same stuff that was you were getting at 3 million. You diluted it five times. So, you know, from the biological standpoint, you take the you hit to save the plant. Otherwise, you lose your plant for a month or so, trying to get back in shape. So there are things written into your permit to allow you to do that under extreme circumstances. And then that outflow, if it didn't meet some sort of standard, that wouldn't be a violation because it's written into that. In other words, if the water wasn't treated and you lost the bug, but you also expelled bad effluent, like is that a violation of some sort? Uh, I can't comment on that. Let's talk to somebody at the state level. <laughs> okay, so it depends. We got any uh, investigators out there? I'm sure we do. Cool, thanks. I don't know how I got the time. I think we're all set with questions for now. That's it? Yep. All right, so this is probably a good point to break before we jump into the activated sludge, because once we get into that, we're going to roll right on through. So. All right, folks on the line, uh, five, ten? Eight minutes. Let's do, uh, let's do an eight-minute break, and we'll be back at uh, 9.58. Thanks. Sure we will. <laughs> All right, everybody, welcome back. We're going to get to activated sludge. I'll go back for a second to the question about the nitrogen and phosphorus being required. There are facilities that, depending on the nature of their incoming wastewater, actually have to supplement this material in order to do it. Uh, if you have, uh oh. I think your computer just fell asleep. Do that. Uh, <laughs> paper mills are notoriously nitrogen deficient in their wastewater. So if you've got a paper mill in town that contributes to the facility, in all probability you have to add nitrogen by some means, aqua ammonia, urea, something like that. When we were shutting down our process in, uh, in New Hampshire, um, yeah, it was an industrial facility, so we were shutting down various production areas uh, over a period of several months, but still running wastewater and we were shutting down the process that provided us with a lot of our phosphorus. We actually had to argue, give you some understanding of how well the regulators understand the real process, had to argue with the state and EPA <coughs> to allow us to store phosphorus acid, because now they will get into the whole hazardous waste thing, in order to keep our bugs working until we actually shut the place down. So we had to have that in order to be able to do it. So. But anyway, we're going to talk about activated sludge process. This is the premier process. Again, trickling filters and RBCs do a very good job of CBOD removal. They can remove the organic matter very well. When it comes to nitrogen and phosphorus, particularly phosphorus, uh, you're kind of uh, at the whim of the face. Activated sludge uh, is where you have the ultimate control. You decide who's around what they do, and by manipulating them, you can get them to do some fantastic work. So, in any case, aerobic biological treatment process where we're going to use these organisms to do our work for us. They're going to remove carbon-based material, and they're going to, in all probability, deal with nitrogen and phosphorus for us to a certain degree. So, this is our very simplified process diagram. Let's see if I can get this arrow off the page. There we go. So our influence, that's the material coming from our primary clarifiers, primary treatment effluent. Uh, we have what we call a biological reactor. You probably uh, will hear the term aeration tank quite uh, commonly if you treat a, go to a treatment facility. Uh, it's going to sound technical, so we call them biological reactors. The difference that we have here, our RBCs and our trickling filters, the air was free. It really didn't have to spend any money. It was just available. It was in the atmosphere and uh, they got it. Here we actually have to provide that. Because this biological reactor is a big large tank, probably 20 feet deep. We've got to get air all the way to the bottom of these tanks. You can't do that just by letting the air float around on top. So that's going to be a big part of it. Uh, we're going to go into our secondary clarifier. You have to remove the bugs. We do that with the other units too. The difference here is See, we actually have a return from that clarifier, slides that we take out, and we send it back into the process. You don't have that with the other systems. 
Your recirculation on a trickling filter doesn't really do that. It's just recirculating water. Here we're sending organisms back in. And by controlling that, and again, we are going to have to waste some. Otherwise, it'll get too populated. So, we've got biological reactors designed for some type of flow, and we'll see some variations of how we can operate these. We have to have an aeration source, it could be mechanical mixes, it could be blowers. We're going to have clarifiers, again, to separate the wastewater from the solids. <coughs> and then we're going to take these solids, and we have to have a method for getting that back into the system. You know, we also have to have means for wasting from the system. So this is another flow diagram. Okay, coming in, a couple of reactors. We've got three clarifiers here, kind of the general flow of things. Yeah, our biological reactors, often called aeration tanks, yeah. are tanks where we may have different uh, conditions set up. See here, we, generally we're going to be aerobic, but when we talk about our uh, nutrient removal, we can get into anoxic zones or anaerobic zones to facilitate that process. Anoxic being essentially oxygen-free, no free oxygen. We may have oxygen in the form of nitrates. We have clarifiers. You're familiar with those from last week's. Uh, the difference from front to the back in terms of clarifiers, your primary clarifiers will be a bit smaller than your secondaries. Uh, your secondaries are almost always circular. There's a new term for you, mixed liquor. Mixed liquor is the term we use for what we have, once we take our incoming primary effluent coming into our biological process, and it's mixed with the sludge that we pulled out of our clarifier, that recycle flow. So we're mixing the organisms in there. So it's a mixture of sludge, basically, and your incoming raw wastewater. Uh, suspended solids, we know what that is. Stuff floating around in water. When we put the two together, we have term we call mixed liquor suspended solids, MLSS. Uh, this indicates the amount of solids that are in our reactor at any point in time. It's a number that we look at on a regular basis. We also have mixed liquor volatile suspended solids, or MLVSS. Remember our organisms, of the dry matter, 90% of it is organic. Well, that's what we're looking at here. Volatile suspended solids indicates the living portion of those mixed liquor solids. Mixed liquor solids could be dead bugs, they could be little bits of who knows what, just debris. But this indicates the living portion. That's who's doing the work for you. So we have to look at that in addition to our mixed liquor. And what we do is we'll run a filtration test. We'll filter out the suspended solids. We can calculate that amount. Then we'll take that filter pad and put it in a muffled furnace at 550 degrees Fahrenheit and burn off all the organics. By subtraction, we know who's out there and who's doing the job for us. Uh, we've got return activated slides, or what we call RAS. It has a suspended solids component. This is a concentrated version. If we have, say, 2,500 milligrams per liter mixed liquor solids in the reactor, our clarifier may have. 5,000, 5,500. We're concentrating solids at the bottom of that tank for a couple of reasons. We want to have a lower flow in terms of volume to send back. It also helps us when we go into solids handling. So we have the sending hungry organisms back into the process to do the job for us. And of course, we have a waste stream. And its solids component. It's essentially the same as our RAS because it's coming out the same point. This particular term, solids retention time or mean cell retention time, uh, is a process control number. Uh, it indicates the average time the solids stay in the system. By controlling this, we determine what we're going to have in our population and what they're going to do. So this is what a biological reactor looks like on an activated sludge process. Big tank, full of water, tons of buds. 
again, when we look at uh, back to our organisms, based on time, that uh, MCRT or SRT, how long we keep a, a organism in the system, again, is the relative number of those organisms based on time. So if we've got our basically amoebas and some uh, flagellates down here, and it's, we keep stuff in the system longer, we can grow more and more in higher life forms. We get up into uh, Stoxilia, it's up in Rotifers and nematodes. And so we want to know where we want to be on that scale of time. This chart, you'll find this in pretty much everybody's lab, is an indication they have this next to their microscope. And based on what they see as a predominance of organisms, it tells you how well your clarifier is going to be performed. And ideally, you want a fair number of stoxiliates, free swimmers, some flagellates. Maybe a couple of rotifers, uh, not much in the way of amoebas, but as we start to see an increase, you know, a shift in that population distribution, it tells us what's happening. So older sludge, we have what's called pin flock on our clarifier, not quite as clean as we'd like. The younger stuff, uh, stragglers, you've got some other issues with it. This is the ideal population breakdown. Again, remembering that that's just guys only make up 5% of the organisms doing the work. So yeah, we got a whole lot of different variations of activated sludge. I know what's going on. And it's really thin slices of the same cake. This is what they call conventional process or plug flow. Uh, sometimes called a folded reactor. Our input comes in, as you can see here. Then we've got these long, narrow channels that it works its way through. Not a lot of information. So the yeah, just it comes in and works as a plug as it moves through. So if you were to tag a bug, you know, you kind of watch it move its way through. Again, air is provided by some means all the way across. So what we see here is as we come in, remember that uh, exponential growth phase of the organisms? Well, there's a lot of food coming in here. Not a lot of bugs. You know, we've got some return sludge flow coming back in. That's it. So they go crazy. You've got a very high oxygen demand here because they've got all this food and there's not many bugs. They could reproduce like crazy. And your population increases as we move through the reactor. As we get over here, the BOD is essentially gone. Uh, so if we just have an even distribution of air at the final end of the reactor here, We've got a lot of excess oxygen, which is wasting money there. We've got a lot of bugs and not much food. So we're actually approaching that endogenous stage back there. They're looking for something to eat. So you can watch that whole life cycle, you know. Exponential here, declining growth as we go through the middle, up towards uh, approaching uh, endogenous growth on the far end of the reactor. Again, identified by a high length to width ratio. Again, narrow channels, not a lot of intermixing. Got to make sure you've got plenty of DO up in the front. Talk about DO in a second. You get a fairly high velocity because of the nature of that construction. And again, your total suspended solids and your volatiles will increase as you go by. Works very well. Uh, less susceptible. As long as you keep that DO up, you won't have any trouble with filamentous bulking. Filamentous bulking is the term that we use when we have predominance of filamentous organisms in the wastewater, and our clarifiers just won't settle properly. We can't clean that water up. And low dissolved oxygen is one of the causes of some particular organisms that thrive in that condition. I see, you give them the conditions they thrive in, they'll take over, so you've got to avoid that. We avoid low DO, all possible uh, options, until it's time to go the other direction. So, our application, domestic industrial, has two of all of these. 85, 95%. BOD removal is simple. Be done in no time at all, really. Aeration type, doesn't matter, diffuse or mechanical. Our SRT, 5 to 15 days. Now, if I'm only concerned with getting my BOD down below 30 or 15 or whatever the number is, 3 to 5 days is more than adequate. You do the job very, very quickly. If I don't pay attention to what's going on, or if I have some problem with my solids handling and I stop moving up into the 15 days, that's where I have to be careful because 
we're going to start to get into that nitrification process by accident, and that can wreak havoc if you're not doing it on purpose. Uh, aeration time, four to 12 hours. Boom, we're done. That's all it takes. Your mixed liquor solids, 1,500 to 3,000 milligrams per liter. Uh, we will vary this during the year. In the summertime, when our wastewater is coming in at about 70, 75 degrees, Warmer, the bugs are more active. We don't need as many bugs to do the job. But as we approach October and the temperatures are starting to drop, for every 10 degrees Celsius drop in temperature on your inflow, and that pretty much goes from in, uh, August down to February, you're going to half the activity of the organism. So if I'm going into wintertime and I'm afraid I'm going to half the activity, I need more bugs to get the job done. So we'll tend to back off on our wasting and build up that population get through the winter months. Then come March, get them out of there because they're going to start going crazy. We have recycled streams various, for various reasons. And here's a new term that we haven't even mentioned yet. F to M, that stands for food to microorganism ratio. And this is the typical range in conventional 0.2 to 0.4 pounds of BOD per day per pound of volatile suspended solids. We don't want too much or too little food for the number of bugs that we've got in there that are actually alive and working for us. So that's actually a control point for us. We may look at this mixed liquor number, but again, it really comes down to the volatile component. And here's one of the thing. I, I talk to operators a lot and ask them, you know, what are they doing here and there for numbers and stuff? A lot of them don't really pay much attention to this volatile stuff. This is an easy test. That's a nice filtration test. Could be done quite simply, blah, blah, blah. The MLVSS, you know, now requires you to go to the muffled furnace and go through that whole process and all that. A good operation is going to track the ratio of volatiles to mixed liquor solids. And typically, that should be 65 to 85%, depending on how your process runs. That particular plant was always in the low 80% range, oddly enough. One of the reasons to look at this, again, just like looking under the microscope, which is not as common as it should be. If you're not paying attention and something's starting to happen to your process and your volatile number is starting to go down, if you're just looking at mixed liquor solids, you may never see that until, you know, somebody comes back with a BOD number that says 28, it's supposed to be 15. It helps watch what's going on. You want to make sure that this, you know, this thing in that ratio at a constant level tells you you've got a good, healthy population that runs in your facility. So it should be looked at. This particular uh, method here, complete mix, is different <coughs> in that now I've got a fairly large tank, and I'm going to distribute my incoming wastewater completely throughout the train. Tank, so that if I sample any location, it's exactly like any other location in that tank. It totally mixes up very quickly. Low length to width ratio, big tank instead of the narrow channels we saw before. Low velocity through the reactor. Again, it will accept wide swings in your material a lot better. It can't be prone to filamentous bulking problems. Largely depend on the type of uh, aeration you have. Those corners can be dead spots uh, that probably have some issues. That process ran somewhat on that. But again, 85 to 95% VOD removal. Piece of cake, 5 to 15 days, same stuff. Not much variation here, really. Just stretching out the F down a little bit to 0.6. But all of that's a typical range for these systems. This particular uh, version, contact stabilization, this is used in facilities that have real problems with I and I, inflow and infiltration. When the rain comes, you just got a huge jump in your uh, water flow. The idea being, I've got two reactors. I've got a contact reactor. Uh, my material is going to come in here, and I've got my recycle stream coming in. I'm going to have about a half an hour to an hour's retention time in there. And in this 
reactor, the bugs are going to adsorb the food to their bodies. They're not going to break it down, they're just going to pick it up. They're going to run them into the clarifier, settle them out, and then send them to a reaeration reactor for three to six hours. That's where they actually break down the food, stabilize. And also repopulate quite a bit. We've got a much higher population in here than we do in this tank. The reason that this works in the high flow conditions, I've got a relatively small amount of solids here. And that high flow rate, I won't overload my clarifier and have a washout. Everybody's pretty much safely back here. Got our resin there. We've got a rapid uptake, adsorption, followed by stabilization. The ads typically used where you've got high I and I problems, which presumably you're working on correcting. Not good if you're nitrifying, you have high solubles. Again, it'll do the job. Yeah. After an hour in the contact tank, three to six hours reaeration. Different populations in each tank. It'll still do the job. And if the engineering firm was nice enough and thoughtful enough, and if your budget was high enough, had it. Fortunately, you folks out in computers can't see this, but if I looked at, break it down simply, this goes back to a, a plug flow facility where we come in here and we come out and we come out there. Well, they give you valving so that I could actually send this around and come in here. Actually, you better come down right here. I'd switch my valve during the rainstorm. I'd come in here. This would be my contact tank, this one short chamber. And then my rouse would come back here, and this would all be re -aeration. By changing your valves, you could change from blood flow into a contact stabilization mode and try to save the plant. Step feed. Step feed is uh, a combination of complete mix and plug flow. Uh, you've got a complete mix setup, but by redistributing your feeds all the way around, you get something very close to a complete mix. And what you've got in this is you've got a very steady oxygen supply all the way through the reactor. Unlike with the plug flow, we had a very high demand up front and very little out the back. Evens things out, keeps you a nice steady uh, oxygen demand all the way through. Again, you look at the numbers, they'll all do pretty much the same type of uh, a job for you. Now, extended aeration. Extended aeration is the process that actually works and relies on that endogenous phase of the organism. And it says extended air, it's not kidding around. Instead of retention times of 5 to 15 days, we're talking 20 to 30 days. These are very common in seasonal towns, beach towns, ski towns, that sort of thing. We've got a big population for a while, and then everybody goes away. The, uh, The thing that's different here, you look at it, everything else looks kind of the same. 85, 95% BOD removal. SRT is longer, definitely. Your aeration time is longer. But the real key that indicates to us is the extended air. It's very low food to microorganism ratio. Well below the bottom 0.2 that we have in the other systems. So again, a lot of bugs, not so much food. They go endogenous, you get less sludge, they eat themselves up. Light, very light loading. Decent amount of sludge per pound. And generally, it's characterized by this type of a process, what we refer to as an oxidation ditch. It's just a big oval. Water keeps running around the circle. Uh, we've got aerators here that move the water and also aerate it. Very common. What I'm most familiar with is up in North Conway. They've got two ditches up there. 
Beautiful plant if you ever want to go see a nice plant. <laughs> right there at the bottom of Route 16 as you come into town. <laughs> that, that is very common. Uh, SBRs are also very common in those type of communities because of the way they're set up. A sequence batch reactor, you can see here, it's a relatively small footprint compared to your typical wastewater plant. The reason for that is everything happens in one tank. They generally do not have primary treatment, so we don't have those clarifiers. They're still going to have preliminary treatment. And our clarifier and our reactor are all the same tank. And we work through discrete cycles to do what we've got to do. Yeah, when the, the high rains come, it's good to have some equalization tankage up front to accept some of that flow so that we're not uh, really pushed to the limit. Uh, they're generally built in multiples of two. Well, one is reacting or settling, the other is taking water in. And you can adapt it quite well to biological nutrients. But a bunch of these up in Vermont, all the ski towns, I don't see P-Town, they have a SBR. Uh, they size down very well. You get some condo associations. They have nice little units that just chug away all day long, a 500-gallon unit. Takes care of the uh, wastewater from the condos. So we've got tank. Could be circular, could be round. You know, tend to go with the uh, rect could be circular, could be round. Uh, could be rectangular, common walls. So we've got to fill. So we're going to pump water in. Then we're going to aerate for some amount of time. When that time has uh, been met, then we're going to kill the air. And now the tank becomes a clarifier. We let all the solids settle to the bottom. Basically, a computerized version of fill and draw that was developed in the 19th century. Uh, at the end of the settling time, we decant off the clean water, and we also pull out some portion of the sludge. We leave some behind that acts as our return sludge, but never left. There's a decant unit, so that'll just slowly draw water until it gets down to a certain level. And down at the bottom is still a little yellow circle. That's a, an aeration disk down there. And if all is going well, you've got idle time before it has to take it again. There were some issues uh, in earlier designs where they didn't have uh, sufficient time from repeating while they're trying to decant. Uh, they work very well. Basically, just chug along without too much of an issue. Okay. 85 95%. Vary your uh, ranges depending on what you're doing. And you can see from 0.05 to 0.3 pounds per pound of LVSS VSS kind of works to range from conventional down into uh, extended air if necessary. Latest version. Well, next to the latest, I guess. A membrane bioreactor. These have been around for 15 years or more now, I guess. What we've got is we've got our reactor. We have the conventional systems. It's operated in a slightly different fashion. And instead of a clarifier, we're going to pull our wastewater through membrane filtration. Extremely tight filtration. So, there's your mixed liquor. There it is after it's gone through the filter. The thing that is it's very different from your conventional system is you're going to run a mixed liquor solids of about 11,000 to 15,000. That is thick stuff. That's one and a half percent solids. So what you've got is you've got a smaller reactor because you can have a higher mixed liquor in there, and you don't need a clarifier. You've got membrane filtration. It also lessens your disinfection requirements because not much is getting through those membranes. It's very expensive. Don't find too many municipal plants with it. Uh, Gillette Stadium, they treat their own water and they run it all through membranes and then we use it in the rest of uh, Rent the village to the shops down there, they use this. Uh, Nantucket Surfside Plant has MBRs. Get more and more common. Uh, again, they're great for smaller, what we call the package plants. The Shoba Technical School or whatever it is up here in Boxborough. They run one of that for their uh, wastewater. 
and the last but not necessarily the greatest iteration of the process. Again, these are for situations moving bed bioreactors. You have to upgrade your plant. We were talking, you've exceeded that 80% or whatever it is, and they say you've got to upgrade to treat more. Well, most plants were built down by the river at one point in time, and you may have some land and you may not. Well, these are this is for places that have no place to go. And since you have no land for more reactors or clarifiers, what you do is you combine a fixed film process with a suspended growth process by throwing in some sort of media into your tanks. Now you've got growth on the media, you've got the fixed liquor swimming around too, so you can process more for a given tankage than you normally could. Uh, but there's an issue when it comes to the wet weather situation and the heavy rains. Do you recall the Hookset incident? Yeah, I remember. Probably still floating out there. Yeah. Uh, Actually, it happened, uh, the first one we heard of was Rotten, Connecticut, I think it was, might have been West Rotten. Uh, I think they had the pink fuzzy balls that they had in theirs. On a heavy rain, all of this water wants to move, it goes up some sort of retention system to keep these things in the tank. Well, with enough flow and force, the retention system failed and everybody escaped. Had a big jailbreak and they all jumped into uh, <laughs> Long Island Sound or wherever. <laughs> And then we had hooks in New Hampshire who uh, sometime later had the same situation. Eight million little discs, although only six million of the eight million they had in the system broke free. It came all the way down the Merrimack River yep. up to Plum Island. Right and by our Island, office. Probably in Morocco by now. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Merrimack, New York, a few months later, had the same kind of an issue. So the EPA kind of backed off for a little bit and said, we've got to come up with some better ways of keeping these guys in. Apparently they have, because they're still doing it. Uh, but again, it's one way to get more processing out of a given volume. Uh, it's the uh, Genzyme Pharmaceutical out in uh, Framingham. They treat their water before they discharge to MWRA, and they use an MDBR for their processing. Again, combining both processes together gets the most treatment out of a given volume. So it's out there. So again, here we have control over the process. Are we going to nitrify? Well, we want to have a certain MCRT. Are we not going to nitrify? We're going to do that. And we, so we can look at various things. Typically, we'll look at pretty much all of them and based on what we see, make decisions. Uh, again, your F to M ratio. If I want to control by my F to M ratio, again, I should be within certain parameters for this thing to work well. What can I control? Can I control the food? What comes in the front door comes in the front door. We've got no control over it. We just have to react to what we've given. I can control the mass by how much I waste. The more I waste, the less mass. I back off from wasting, I'm going to have more mass. Mean cell residence time. How long are the bugs in the system? Well, this is controlled by how much you waste. Got so many in there, and I lessen the time that they're in the system by wasting more. I take more out. Or if I want to build that time up, then I don't waste so much. So I come down to wasting. Sludge age. It's another term somewhat similar to that, but different. Uh, again, controlled by how much is in the system. Again, it. it all comes down to this last item. No matter which term I want to go by, it comes down to how much I'm going to waste in the end. So, you know, I can say, well, I'm going to maintain a certain mean cell residence time. That's great, but you're going to do it by wasting. It all comes down to this. And that's where, you know, we talk about issues with the problem. If you have trouble with your solids handling and you can't waste, well, then you get into the trouble. We control what's happening what they're going to do. So, again, we have a different type of a system from the fixed film in that we have to supply oxygen, so we need to get that oxygen to the bugs. We need to run typically between 2 and 4 milligrams per liter is generally the target range we look for. You can run down towards 1, but you don't want to take a chance on 
generating some filamentous bacteria. Uh, what you see in this picture is mechanical aeration. Uh, just a big mix maxer thrown into the middle of your tank. This particular part of the process is the most expensive thing that we do. Spend huge amounts of money on electricity to aerate these organisms. Okay, one to four, ideally two to four, and hopefully we've got even a uh, very good control over that now. Different methods of doing, we've got uh, a surface aerator here, that's mechanical mixing. The two pictures on the left are what we refer to as diffused aeration. There's various types of systems out there to provide this. Mechanical surface aerators, you go out to uh, Amherst. Amherst Mass, their treatment plant, they have uh, surface aerators tethered into their reactors. Basically, just an air, uh, axial flow pump sucks water in from below and then just sprays it out into the air, picks up oxygen quite readily. In the winter time, these things can ice up and be problematic. That's what they look like. This is the picture on the right is the way they have it out in Amherst. They're tethered inside a tank and there are some that are bridge mounted. Actually out there on a structure churning up the waters. This is increasingly disappearing from processes for a couple of reasons. For one thing, part of the process here, in addition to removing the BOD, is we need to remove those suspended solids, the colloidal stuff that's just hanging around. So the bugs will do that, it'll stick to that sugary substance on their bodies, and we want to form these nice, large, flock particles that we see under the microscope. That later. Because the larger the flock particle, the more mass, the more mass, the better it settles. But if I'm going to form a nice flock particle, then I've got to take it here and run it through my ninja rocket, whatever the heck that thing And I just churn it up. The other thing is, if you think of it, these tanks are rectangular. So this is centered somewhat in the center of the tank. How well is my aeration in those corners? Quite distance from that mechanical mixer. And if I have low DOs there, then, you know, no, I'm not tired of you. S Nathans and some of those other low DO elements could thrive and give me troubles. The other thing, if you walk out here, well, there's always vapor in the air with these things. So now I'm ingesting that stuff. Plus, you walk out onto that bridge in the middle of February, could have your cleats on because it's pretty darn slippery out there. Not a great thing. That's what those uh, aerators look like. They sit inside that well literally feeding the air into that water. And you control it, you control it by the speed of the uh, mixer itself, or you can raise or lower the water level to the emergence of the blade. Uh, we talked about oxidation ditch. This is the type that they have there. It's a horizontal rotor, and they do actually control it by raising and lowering the water level of the ditch as to how much those little fingers pound the uh, air into the water. We go to diffused air, it's a better choice. This is what you look like. Not a lot of turbulence, nice even, even coverage of oxygen into the corners everywhere, nice and uniform, no low DO areas. Works very well. Yeah. Two purposes to this is keep everything in suspension, that's part of the process, and also to aerate it. So, very good job. But again, now I have to pump air down to the bottom of the 25-foot tank. 25 feet of water plus the diffuser back pressure, so I'm running 20, 25 PSI back pressure on that system. This is the upper unit, the white pipe with the little disc there. That's a nice fine bubble diffuser, and this metal one down below is a coarse bubble diffuser. There's arguments as to which is better. Ceramic type. This is like the stone you might have in your uh, aquarium. Same thing. Fine bubble diffuser. 
millions and millions of blue air bubbles going out there. There's a lot. I don't keep it agitated. Different types of aluminum silicate, and membrane types. Basically, a, a rubber type of a membrane that when the air pressure is behind it, opens up very tiny holes in the membrane, allows it to pass off through. But it takes a lot of and they have to be cleaned on a regular basis and repaired and stuff. And they clean. You can see the depth of that tank. So how do we get the air down there? Uh, today, most plants are using things like positive displacement blowers, a roots type blower, or you can use a centrifugal blower. The difference being a, see those first two words there, positive displacement? That means something's going someplace. Don't close the valve, unless you want a bad day. Uh, centrifugal blower is much like a centrifugal pump. You can shut that down for a while. Fans will just spin, it won't really cause much of an issue. There's a big PD blower, big root type of blower. See that silver unit on the far end is pressure relief, just in case by some means uh, the valves get shut. It won't blow everything apart. Rupture your eardrums. The blower, very tight displays. You can't get a piece of paper between those two lobes at that location. Air comes in, gets pumped up, and pushed out. Ideally, because electricity is so expensive, particularly in this part of the country, and we're using so much of it, uh, you'll have a uh, control loop in there. You'll have a dissolved oxygen meter in the tank, and you'll have a control loop set up. So they say, I want to control it at 2 milligrams per liter, and this will sense what's going on in the tank, and it either speeds up the blowers or slows them down. So you don't put in any more energy than you need to, but you always get what you do need. Big motors. Uh, Upper Blackstone, where I do most of my training, has three 800 horsepower blowers. I don't want to pay that electric. So. The centrifugal blower, yeah, this one's a little more forgiving, and they actually open and close the inlet veins to control the airflow through these. Multi stage centrifugal blower. PD blowers, we're talking. A lot of air, upwards of 50,000 CFM per unit. And up to 25 to 30 PSI, see, so some pressure uh, concerns when you're dealing with these things. These are the latest and the greatest so far. Uh, this is a turbo blower. This thing is operating at 28,000 RPM. You walk into uh, the room with those roots blowers, you got to have your earplugs that you end up like me every one year. Uh, these things are absolutely amazing. Uh, the reason that they, they run at about 40% of the horsepower of a conventional unit because they have no bearings. That one's one. I was in the room, and this is the very similar to the setup up in Franklin, New Hampshire. And honestly, the three blowers in there, you can't tell which one's running except by the operating lights. You can hear air rushing through the, the pipes, but quiet as can be. Saved a lot of money. Uh, and all this air needs to be, uh, why is this in here? You've got filter systems. You don't want to be pulling dirt in there. Particularly if you've got diffusers, you'll clog them up and make this gets some impingement or dry barrier or an electrostatic precipitator. Various ways of cleaning up the air before we pump it down the bottom of the tank. Airflow measurement. Uh, what we have in here is an orifice plate measuring flow. Uh, an orifice plate is a steel plate that sits inside the pipe and it's got a diameter uh, of a hole inside it that's considerably smaller than the diameter of the pipe in which it's sitting. And by measuring the pressure drop across that plate and knowing the characteristics of that particular orifice, you can actually calculate the airflow, the differential pressure unit up on top of it. It takes that out, sends the information to a controller. They can regulate how much air is going to any uh, tank. 
tank at any point in time. It's another method of doing it. Thermal mass air flow meter, a lot less pressure drop. Again, ideally, this is your system. Got a sensor, geo meter that sits inside your tank. You have multiples in there. There's probably three of them in each of the tanks up the up the Blackstone. And they feed back into a controller and that'll tell the blower to ramp up or ramp down. So at any point in time, at nighttime when your flow's way down, you don't have much demand. No sense blowing a lot of air in there and wasting electricity. Some facilities will use high purity oxygen instead of just regular air. Air is 21% oxygen. Now we're talking about 90% plus in a high purity oxygen. Deer Island is high purity oxygen. The Lynn treatment plant is high purity oxygen. Holyoke, they run high purity oxygen. Um, theoretically, you could have a smaller reactor because you've got so much more oxygen there. And they tend to be enclosed. Because again, we're pumping all this oxygen in, we want to recycle it as much as possible. We've got uh, special mixers in there that help take the uh, air from the, the headspace and pump it back down so we can get as much of that oxygen. And then it vents based on the amount of CO2 in the system and adds new stuff in there. It's done. Again, theoretically, you get smaller reactors. That's fine. Uh, it also seems to be in locations where you're very concerned over odors. Special treatment plant. Your reactors really shouldn't smell badly, but they have a particular odor to them. <coughs> and Deer Island's right out there on the harbor. You got to drive through Winthrop, which is not exactly the dumpy part of town, uh, and they want to make sure everybody's happy over there. So that's all enclosed. Lynn is just up the road from them too. Uh, we can truck in our liquid, liquid oxygen. Actually, Holyoke used to generate their own. Now they truck theirs in. Uh, Deer Island uses cryogenic system. They generate their own high purity oxygen. Lynn is using uh, pressure swing absorption generate theirs. <coughs> yeah, smaller reactor size, but there's downsides too. A lot of capital investment, uh, very complicated system to operate. You've got safety concerns with high oxygen content areas. Take the first one. So, I don't know if you recall the picture we had coming out of our primary clarifiers. It's relatively clean looking water. This is what comes out of your reactor. The difference being that population of organisms that you've grown. So it comes in looking like you know, slightly dirty water to look more like chocolate milk. Uh, you're talking 2,500 to 3,000 milligrams per liter of solids in there. Really a quarter to a third of a percentage of the solid standard. So now we have to take that and make it nice, clean looking water. Ideally, it should look like drinking water. It generally does. So we, once again, we're going to go through clarifiers or sediments or sedimentation tanks, whatever you want to call them. Uh, show somebody taking a sludge reading at the edge of the tank. So again, what we want to promote through all of this process, and when you look at Mixed liquor in your tank, you should be able to identify this. This is our flock, nice, strong flock particle, very clear, supernatant around it. That's what we want to see. That's why mechanical aeration is not exactly ideal. You got to chop that up. It doesn't take much to break this apart. We're going to minimize our turbulence. Nice. So this is what we want, not the sheared flock. That's been broken apart, it's not going to settle well. We're going to have some turbidity issues. We're going to have some problems with our suspended solids program. So again, we're coming out of our reactor down into a clarifier. Again, generally just gravity flow. Our secondary clarifier generally is a circular tank. There are some places that run rectangulars. Not my favorite. Again. 10 to 16 foot straight wall depth. Uh, and on the, the flows of the plant, anywhere from 40 feet up to 120, 160. Is 
same principle. We're going to feed into the center of this. We're going to have a big baffle, this big circular wall. This interior portion is called the feed well. Some units will have little agitators in there. They're called flocculators. Just keep the flock moving around, bump into each other so they can form larger particles. No high speed mixing. Uh, solids are going to drop to the floor. Shouldn't be much for floatable material, but you'll have some foam and stuff that has to be dealt with. Another view of the same thing. There's a lot of variations in uh, design that's been developed over the years. Uh, on this one, you see an interior Londa here right in the, the forefront of the picture. I'll explain the reason for that in a little bit. So, the difference between this and what we had up front in our primary is the fact that up in the primary we're going for settleable solids. This is material that will drop to the bottom of the tank under quiescent conditions. Now we're talking about clumps of bacteria. Even when they form a nice flock particle, still not that dense of material. So we will have a larger clarifier in the back than we would at the primary. If you've got an 80 footer up, the primary, you've probably got 120 for your secondaries. You need more time for this material to settle. It's not a settleable solid as it was up front. The other thing that we're going to do here is we're going to maintain a sludge blanket, a layer of solids at the bottom of the tank. Two reasons for that. As the material comes down and keeps settling, it compresses that and concentrates it. So if I've got mixed liquid of 2,800, I'm probably running 5,500 to 6,000 on my sludge at the bottom of the tank. So my pump to send return material back to the reactor is smaller because it's concentrated. And my pumping out to my waste is smaller also. But whatever comes out of this material out of here has to go to solid tin. And if I'm going anywhere, basically, I've got to have these 20% solids. So I've got to get rid of all that water. So if I can get rid of a good portion of it here, so much the better. So there's concerns that there are density currents here based on temperatures, and some people think the moving of the rate mechanisms generate some currents. And again, we're talking flock of bacteria, so it doesn't take much to keep them suspended. We want this quiet. Uh, so there's all sorts of methods out there to prevent things from happening. Go back here again. You look at this, you follow the arrows. The thought is that the baffle will push it downwards, it scoots across the blanket, and then comes right up along the wall. So it really is not there for the standard detention time that you would calculate. It never is, but it's not even close. So the shorter time it is in here, the less time for things to settle. So I'm going to carry material over when this comes out. So the Stanford baffle, it's actually the Crosby baffle. Dr. Crosby uh, came up with this design, but he was working at Stanford, so incorporated that title. Uh, put this slope addition along the wall, so if that material came across the bottom of the tank, came up the wall, it would hit this, have to return back towards the center before it could head towards the effluent weir. Again, trying to keep it in that much longer so the solids would actually drop out. another variation, secondary baffle. This one's fairly high. Uh, upper Blackstone is installed there as it sits over the rake mechanism. It's probably not even put off the floor. So, being it's going to come out of the feed well in the center. Try to move, it's going to hit this baffle, have to go over or under it. Again, just another means of holding it in the tank that much longer, close to its uh, theoretical detention time. Primary clarifiers, an hour and a half to two and a half hours is generally adequate. On secondaries, you're talking two to three. It's just that much more time for the stuff to settle up because it is so light. Again, the internal launder. Instead of having it out of the outer periphery of the tank, again, if the material runs across and hits the wall and comes up, well, now it's got to turn around and come back about a third of the distance towards the center before it hits that effluent. Another way to hold stuff in long. So, same thing, we've got a scum baffle. Uh, this is something that uh, I can almost promise you you'll find no matter what plant you go to, and that clarifier, they're going to have a hose spraying water there. It's just part of the business, largely because of some of the foam and stuff. Now, we also 
also differs somewhat in how we remove the sludge from this tank from what we would have had on our primary. Our primaries, uh, generally this is plowed down into the sump, as you see here, and then drawn away uh, with a pump. Siphon systems, uh, draft tubes, <coughs> sludge recovery, whatever term you want to use, is very common with secondary clarifiers. Again, we're dealing with a relatively light material. So instead of plowing this down into a sump, a rake mechanism, the blades, instead of all being oriented in the same direction, now form a V. And at the apex of a V is a pipe that comes down. And all these pipes go up into a box that's isolated from the water in the clarifier. So as this slowly plows around, it's pushing material towards these pipes. And if we get see the pipes on the left-hand side, inside that box, the piping arrangement on the brake mechanism. Here we go. Inside that box, you see there's an opening from that pipe. This opening is below the operating level of the clarifier itself. So now I've got a hydraulic gradient and the water wants to flow downhill. So as the water flows, it easily picks up the solids off the bottom, carries it with it up into this box, and then it's a pipe that takes this off uh, to be handled later on. One thing that's and the good about this is that you've got a nice even pull of sludge across the floor as opposed to the plowing mechanism to a sump where you may not have an even distribution. You're going to pile it up, uh, as we're going to see in a minute. A lot of things that come into play. Uh, a mixed liquor concentration. These clarifiers, uh, on the front end, we're not concerned about a solid flow. Secondary, we are. They're only good for so many pounds per day per square foot. So if we ran our mixed liquor up to a real high number, we're not going to settle out properly. Certainly flow is a big factor. It affects your detention time and currents. Your return sludge flow can affect things by how deep you let that sludge blanket go, how much you pull it down, service area of your clarifier over which you have no control. And how settleable is your sludge? You got filamentous, well then you got some issues. And there are parameters, design parameters, not something that an operator would calculate on the course of a day. A wear loading rate, uh, we talked talk about wear loading rates on our primaries of 10 to 40,000 gallons per day per foot. Here it's 10 to 20,000. That's the maximum, half the rate. Start up front. Right. Surface overflow rate, surface loading rate, uh, is 800 to 1,200 gallons per day per square foot on a primary. Now we're down to 6 to 800 just because of the nature of the material we're settling in. And here we do have to be concerned with solid flow. <clears throat> 12 to 30 pounds per day per square foot, recommended area. Well, mixed liquor is running way too high for some reason, it's not gonna settle out. Uh, I experienced this when I took over my plant, they used to run ridiculous mixed liquor numbers. We couldn't settle it for love nor money. Way too high, so it's a concern on this one. Uh, take a good look at that picture. That look good to you? That's why I don't recommend rectangulars on the secondary. This is Wallingford, Connecticut. This is about six years ago. And I, I, was, I was just staring at that thing. The operator came over and says, oh, yeah, there's no problem with that. We're good. That was my clarifier. I would go back home and call it sick for the day. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible thing. So, yeah, we carry a sludge blanket, and we need to keep track of where this thing is. So we do measurements on this, and a lot of them are done manually with this big plastic tube called a sludge judge. <laughs> uh, you put sections, and you crank as many as you need together so you can reach the bottom. It's a clear plastic tube, and you go out to a certain location out of the bridge. But people do it in various places. As long as everybody does it in the same spot the same way, then it's no big deal. Uh, that's when somebody's doing it in a different place. That it can Drop it down slowly, reaches the bottom of the tank, and the bottom of it is a little ball check. So when you're going down, it allows the water to come into the tube. As you pull it up, that ball check sits. You pull it up, and you actually have a core sample of your clarifier at that point. You can see where the sludge is, the transition between the thickened sludge and the clear supernatant, and all that. Gives you a good idea of what's going on. It's an important uh, tool to use. There are devices out there that can, uh, ultrasonic devices that can sense level of the blanket. I've never worked with one. I don't know uh, 
how accurate they are or what they'll tell you, but I like to sledge judge myself. All sorts of Here's a uh, test that is done on a regular basis to see how well your clarifier is doing. It's called sludge volume index. This particular uh, glass cylinder is called the Mallory Settleometer. And what you do is you take a sample of your mixed liquor and location right at the end of your reactor as it's going to the clarifier. Uh, and then you pour a one liter, so, well, this can come in one liter and two liter units. But uh, the settlement is graduated zero to a thousand, no matter which one you've got. You fill this up to a thousand with your mixed liquor, and then you let it sit for a half an hour. You take a look and you see, see what the settled sludge is after that half hour point. It also gives you an indication, again, look at this. This uh, hopefully is not settled yet, but that supernatant is far from desirable. You want to see how that looks. Got a clear break, nice settled solids here, and clear supernatant, nothing floating on the top. And you do a calculation. You settle sludge volume for 30 minutes times 1,000 milliliters per liter, and you divide it by your mixed liquor suspended solids concentration, you get a number. Theoretically, 80 to 150 is where you want to be. If it's below 80, you're settling too fast, and you're going to leave some material behind. If it's Above 150, theoretically, you're not settling well and you're going to have a problem. <clears throat> it's a sludge blanket. This is, a, this is typical of the type of a profile of your sludge blanket that you might see in a clarifier that plows it down to a sump. Not necessarily one that has drafters. It's going to kind of collect down here. And that's not bad. Kind of going, everything's moving towards the sump as it should be. In this particular situation, this actually occurred to me, it took me a, a day or so to figure out what was going on. For some reason, the sludge was not plowing down to the sump. Now, we don't want to have too high a sludge blanket in the tank. The reason being that there's no more oxygen or very little oxygen left here. There's still a little bit of food, there's still a lot of bugs. So they're going to consume whatever's left. Once the oxygen is depleted, they're going to go after other sources of oxygen. That's where the faculty of bacteria come in. If you have nitrates in there, because you're nitrifying or something else, uh, they're going to go after that and break it down, or you can just go septic and generate some methane gas or hydrogen sulfide, and all of these gas bubbles will accumulate. You finally have enough force to pop that sludge blanket up to focus on the surface of your clarifier and just ruin your whole morning. But you don't want that to happen. It's what happened to me. And typically, as your sludge blanket rises, one of your controls is you increase your return sludge flow, pull it out of the tank. So you find out what's really going on. It's well, the first move you make. Well, as I did that, I increased the flow. But again, the flow is going to be right here by this incoming pipe, pulling the material away. And apparently, the increase in flow just exacerbated the problem and that it prevented stuff from coming down. I just was rat holing through here. The material just kept staying on the outer periphery of the rakes. And they just get these big blobs of stuff come floating to the surface and drive us crazy. Uh, finally kind of figured out what might be going on and got way back on my return sludge flow. And within 12 hours, all the material moved back down where it should be and was able to pull it out of there. So your secondary clarifier, pretty nice looking water here, nice and clean, should look like drinking water, ready to go to disinfection. Now the stuff that we rarely see is money. Um, this is all the piping and uh, pumps for your return sludge flows, maybe in galleys underneath the ground. You don't get to see if you're just doing a normal walk around. I don't know how to remove that stuff backwards. This is a low mass. Actually, uh, so it's a low drip Connecticut. Again, the RAS flow, typically, uh, very commonly said at about 50%. Uh, some philosophies will say, okay, we're going to keep it at a certain flow rate and we'll leave it there no matter what happens, and some will tie it to your incoming flow. If your incoming flow goes up, mostly you're going to get more stuff. You also increase your RAS accordingly, but figure out a a scheme that works best for you and let it go. Uh, return 
turn activated sludge much thicker than what we saw coming out of the reactor. <coughs> Uh, again, probably 5,000 to 6,000 milligrams per liter is pretty typical of the concentration at this point. Uh, the bulk of it going back into the reactors, and some of it being wasted. <coughs> okay, that is your control, all the new wasting system. Questions on the activated sludge? Um, yeah, so could you, could you speak a little more on how the scum baffle works? The scum baffle? The scum baffle is just a, a plastic strip that will run around. I can draw it here, but that won't help them. Uh, it sits just outside your effluent weir. And it probably goes 12 inches, 10, 12 inches below the surface of the water. So anything that floats is going to hit that baffle and can't pass through to the effluent weir itself. That makes sense? Like it's a, a physical barrier. It's a wall for the floating yeah. Yeah. So it just can't get by that. You'd have to have a heck of a deep scum layer to get past and underneath that thing. Is that it? Uh, yeah, I had a, a question that might be um, off base here, but regarding just the uh, the sheer energy demand of some of these uh, plants. Is there ever a case of localized energy production, whether it's capitalizing on hydro or, or solar or something more traditional or biological? We are seeing uh, a lot of facilities have taken up whatever uh, available free land they have and put in solar arrays. Uh, I think Upper Blackstone's probably got four acres solar array. Pittsfield's got a pretty good size one out there. Uh, the other thing that's being employed is some facilities that do anaerobic digestion are taking the uh, methane gas from that process and using that to supplement uh, the energy requirements, either for heating the digester or running some equipment, that sort of stuff. And all those examples are supplement, supplementing, so they're, so they're not totally producing their own demand? No. Okay. Not that I know of. Uh, and you do find uh, there's a number of them out there that do have uh, wind turbines set up. Got a big one or two out there on Deer Island now. Any questions in the room? Can you go back to the secondary clarifier slide, I think? Which one? The, this? Just the... Oop, that one. So the water comes in in the middle of the tank. Yep. And then it's there's a retention time and the sludge settles. So and it, there, you can see just the, the baffle just protruding above the water level right here. Yeah. That's the feed well. It's going to come in, hit that, and go downwards. And then it falls into that trough in the middle. Right. And then does it get pumped to the neck, to the outer ring? Or how does it, is that what, that this water? This is going to, there's a pipe. There are drain pipes in the bottom of this trough. You'll see that. It'll go to a distribution box then off to disinfection. So what's the, out, the outer ring? This outer ring here? Yeah. That's a baffle. There's a scum baffle on both sides of this laundry. So, but what, what, the outer ring of water is what water? I guess is that what? That's settled water also. Okay, so it's the, it's the okay. same water as over there. This does not go all the way to the floor. Okay. The water passes underneath here. Again, the idea here being uh, okay. the water that shoots across the bottom comes up the outer wall. Okay. Now it has to turn around and go backwards. I got it, I got it. That's one of the methods that they use to try to keep it in there that much longer, that internal launder rather than one that's on the outside. Yeah, okay, so that trough, the middle trough actually doesn't go down to the bottom. Right. Okay. No, it's only so deep. Okay. <clears throat> All right, boom. We can go back in time. Lagoon systems, very common in rural areas. Hard to find one. There's probably two of them in uh, Massachusetts. You go north of Massachusetts, they'll be all over the place. Uh, okay. Very low tech. It dates back to early days AD, uh, for that matter. Uh, it's pretty much letting Mother Nature do its job. Uh, this is uh, actually in Rangeley, Maine. The large tank here at the bottom is stormwater retention. And then you've got 
two cells here uh, operating the, uh, the wastewater treatment. And it goes way back, to actually, they use it to grow fish. Grow fish. Eat tilapia? <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> uh, general categories of stabilization pond, raw treatment with no prior treatment, and oxidation ponds have some primary treatment. Uh, but they're predominantly stabilization ponds that you'll find out in the rural areas. And here's a, a scheme of uh, a two cell pond. We've got a flow meter, we've got a bar screen, we still want to take out the big chunk. And then we just go into the pond. They typically have uh, 30 days detention time per cell. Uh, you might have two, you might have three. The thing about it is, uh, it's very low tech. It's your biological reactor, it's also your clarifier. Uh, go from here, we'll close into the next one. Uh, some are aerated, some are shallow enough you don't have to. They work pretty well for a number of years. The issue with these things is that again, they're out in a rural community, small town, uh, low flows. Uh, it's probably overseen by some sewer board, and the majority of whom don't even know where the lagoon is. They get elected to something, <laughs> and they ignore the fact that this has been used as a clarifier for the past 15 years. Now, a pond that used to be eight feet deep is only four feet deep, and they can't get the treatment that they're looking for. So then you have to come in and get all of those solids out of those tanks. Uh, is that a, uh, a class on lagoon treatment uh, many years ago, back when I was at Hampshire, and they had just said, this is here. Went to Loom? Yep. Went to the McDonald's? No. No? That's right there at the uh, offering. Mm -hmm. We went into the parking lot, took a French fry, threw it over the fence, and probably made them a pond. We had a good arm. <laughs> it's right there. They had just cleaned that out. They had uh, divers in there for a month cleaning out one of the cells. Sucking all the stuff out of that. They're lined, right? So there's no infiltration. They're lined. They should be lined. Can't guarantee they are. <laughs> this part of the country, I'll bet you they are. But yeah, if uh, they got a picture of the uh, one of the divers standing at the inlet port, up the center of the first cell, and the water no longer came up to its knees. Stuff just comes out and just drops right there. You just lose it over time. And just in fact, and boom, away it goes. Probably have an operator overseeing four plants uh, in any given area. We could have an aerobic pond. It's only two to three feet deep. You don't need any aeration because at that depth, sunlight penetrates all the way to the bottom. Grow algae. Algae suck up CO2 and give off oxygen. Bacteria suck up oxygen, give off CO2. It's a wonderful relationship. Anaerobic ponds are deep. So deep that the sunlight can't penetrate to the bottom, so whatever sells to the bottom becomes anaerobic and then brings down under anaerobic conditions. And then there's facultative, kind of in between as far as depth, aerobic at the top, anaerobic at the bottom, facultative in between, they kind of do this. Yeah, they, they can do a pretty decent job. I know what's happening. But they do take some maintenance. Here we got uh, stuff called duckweed that generates uh, around the edges and all that, prevents, uh, promotes insect growth. That's to be dealt with. It. Uh, the levees, we've got a bunch of muskrats and that sort of stuff. If you're not careful, the, uh, the banks will give way and then all of your water goes down into the stream, which is not very desirable. And uh, again, since they are very low tech and not much control, they can be kind of smelly, but since they're out in the middle of nowhere, it doesn't seem to be much of an issue for anybody. You can do it. No, I can. That must be the end of it. Is that right? It is. What about, uh, just jump in here, um, speaking of critters, um, like waterfowl, they ever does that have a problem with not only them being there, but the waste they might add to the system? Uh huh. You can go to pretty much any plant, and if you look at the clarifiers and or some of the other channels that might be uh, carrying water, and you'll find uh, monofilament being strung in a zigzag fashion 
around trying to keep the ducks and the seagulls out of them, but invariably they get in there. They always do. It's, it's not the the only real concern is when they're swimming around your chlor chlorine contact chamber because that's not where you want them to go pooping. You got, you got to do a bacterial test after, <laughs> and that could be a problem. But yeah, they they always manage to get their way through. Other than that, yeah, you may get a snake or a turtle now and then. Snapping turtles are a real problem with lagoons. <laughs> any questions in here? Uh, any any last minute questions you guys want to shoot through chat? We'll give it another couple minutes. And a uh, friendly reminder, I, I want to make an effort to put Unit 1 and Unit 2 online for you all uh, that are listening before Unit 3. And just as a reminder, we're gonna, uh, not going to be able to do it next week, so the next training will be February 1st, which is two weeks from today. And we'll have, uh, I'll, I'll go ahead, someone from Wastewater will reach out to this uh, listserv about, uh, you know, when those, when those go up online. Uh, so I don't see any questions coming in. Feel free to reach out to myself or Jim uh, with questions that you think of after the fact, and we'll work to get back to you or address it um, in the next training. So thanks for joining today, and see you all in two weeks. Have a good one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.